Okay, <laughs> and we're in, we're in. Um, hi everybody, uh, welcome to Mishnah Monday. Um, we are today uh, going to take a look at one of my favorite Mishnayot, uh, uh, one that speaks about a prayer that we say when we study Torah. Okay, so let's start with a prayer or uh, a form of prayer, a blessing that we say over Torah study. We'll say it together as a as a ritual, but then I also want us to be able to analyze and think about it a little bit. So um, the blessing, um, which many of you will be familiar with, is a blessing um, that begins in the standard way, Baruch HaTah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedeshanu V'mitzvotah V'tzivanu, and then the final words, which we'll take some time to think about today, are La'asok B'divrei Torah, to immerse ourselves, uh, let's say, or busy ourselves, with words of Torah. Okay, so uh, join me if you wish. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. All right, so I want to um, actually start with uh, that blessing um, before we get to the Mishnah today, because uh, essentially that blessing is doing in, for us in some ways what the Mishnah that we're gonna look at does, but it's doing it differently. And so that's gonna be our question. Um, what, whatever happened to the original prayer that we said for learning? So here's your source sheet for the day. And uh, let's head in. Um, we just looked at uh, this blessing right here. Oh, uh, Jess, I'm gonna need screen sharing. You got it. Thank you. All right, these are, this is, here's the blessing we just said, and actually there are three of them. Um, I'm using the Sidur Ashkenaz here uh, because it's the version that we use at Ikar, uh, or, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, most uh, American, uh, conservative shuls. Um, okay, here we are. Uh, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with God's commandments. And here, v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Okay, um, it's always nice to have an Israeli on the line. So, uh, Yonatan, uh, help us out. La'asok, what, what does that mean? I, I agree with your translation of busy ourselves. To busy ourselves, okay to be involved with words of Torah, to busy ourselves with words. Now, okay, good. The Yonatan ag agrees with the translation to busy ourselves, but what, what about the sentiment? I mean, what, what is that? What's that blessing about? Thanks God for letting me be busy, to busy myself with words of Torah. What's the sentiment there? Is, is the purpose of Torah so that I stay busy? Yeah, Wendy, what do you think? Wendy and then Leah. And I think to really, this is how you occupy your time, your attention, your everything. That this, this uh, is your, your attention in all within your physical and mental, you're busy with. This is what, where your attention is. Okay, great. So this is, this is the area of focus that you should have in your life. Leah? Mine was similar, like occupy your mind, like be focusing on Torah, like all the time and like mitzvot and all things like that. Why do you need to occupy your mind? Like what's the worry here? Hal, you got a thought? I mean, what occurred to me is uh, you can busy yourself with the Torah because you don't have to busy yourself with anything else. In other words, there's a kind of freedom to study the Torah, uh, and that's what you're thanking God for. Ah, ah, okay. So one version is, um, thanks for giving me um, the, um, the, the space in my life that allows me to fill it with Torah. That is, thanks for giving me the opportunity to spend some of my time with Torah. Otherwise, I might have been busy with other things, right? Hira, what do you think? I would say that uh, it means to be focused in what you're doing. You're not just going through the motions. 
And that's okay, I, that's good. But that's a, okay. That's a different valence. Well, but that's what I get by by the interpretation of being yourself. If, if you're not going to do it wholeheartedly, you're wasting your time. That's the interpretation I get. Yeah, there's a kind of an injunction here. Once we say thank you for letting me busy myself with Torah, then it's like I once I'm with Torah, I have to be kind of busy. Like I, I really have to be intensely in it. Right. So even as I say the blessing, I'm kind of I'm stating a, a, a sort of a certain approach or attitude towards Torah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's hear uh, some of the other blessings that we say in the morning. There are actually three. And usually uh, we just together before these lessons recite the first. But here are some other sentiments. And I want us to have them all in mind before we look at the Mishnah. Um, and please, Lord, our God, make the words of your Torah pleasant in our mouths and in the mouths of all of your people, the house of Israel. The word here in Hebrew is v'harevna, make sweet um, these words of Torah in our mouths. And may we and our offspring and the offspring of our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us be knowing of your name and studying your Torah for its sake. Blessed are you, Lord, who teaches Torah to God's people Israel. Okay. That's a different sentiment. What's going on here? Let's see who's. What's going on here? So we were so far. We've been told to um, busy ourselves with Torah. Now what? Now what are we asking for? I'm gonna put it back on the screen. Uh, Sophia, maybe just like let it be an enjoyable experience, perhaps so that you do it, and when you're involved with it, it's pleasurable to you. Also. Okay. Okay, that's good. Busyness doesn't, is not my favorite word, right? If you say, oh, I'm very busy studying Torah these days, that doesn't sound so pleasant. So now we're adding sweetness or pleasantness that it should be an enjoyable experience as well. I should be, as Hiro said, focused. Um, I, should, I, I should thank God that I'm able to busy myself in this way and, and not with other things. But it shouldn't just be busy work. I, I, I hope that it, there's something enjoyable, sweet, pleasant about it. What else do we see in here? What else have we got in here? Wendy? I think it's also, I think it's tied to let us, to let us. I think this is a privilege. This is something that's uplifting. Not only, um, and so not only are we to do these things, you know, because we do them and keep ourselves busy, but this is something that is uplifting and can uplift others and can look on the rest of the the world can look at the people of Israel is something that is uplifted in what we do and what we say so that this whole uh, notion of Torah is something that is a privilege um, and, and um, uh, uh, um, a gift in a sense a gift that we're sharing this is Plus this pleasantness. This okay, pleasantness. I think Wendy's right. This, so, oh, up here, there wasn't anything um, particularistic about the commandment to study Torah. It's just always a blessing to be able to be busy with Torah. But here, in this blessing, there, there begins to be a focus on the house of Israel. And the house of Israel are the people that know God's name and study the Torah. And, as Wendy's saying, we're the ones that got the Torah. Right? We are the what God taught the Torah to us. It was a gift to us. So we should recognize the Torah as a gift, a blessing that we receive and be grateful for it. Not just busy with it, but, um, and, but uh, enjoying the pleasant, the sweet experience and be grateful for it. Okay, anything else uh, you want to add there that you're seeing in this blessing about the offspring? David? Um, well, I'm, I love the... Uh... I, I'm stuck on mouths, and uh, it makes me think of, you know, ingesting, so digestible, um, but also nourishing. So I, I kind of go to that nourishing place. Maybe we'd be nourished by it. Okay, that's interesting. There's a lot. I love that. I, I hadn't thought about the sweetness language here. Like, make it sweet in our mouths. So there is something food-like about this blessing. Like, as we taste the Torah, as we speak it out, like make that a like the the taste of it is is sweet. We 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 enjoy the taste, and therefore David says 
that analogy to food suggests that there's something sustaining about this. There's something that we that we need this nourishing about the Torah. I love that. Um, Leah, what, do you, what were you thinking? Well, just going back to the offspring, I mean, it goes like generation, generation, generation. It goes so extreme. And I'm not sure if it's very common to see, but how it also talks about the, the Israel as well, like not just like actual, like genetically, but also just the people, Israel as well. So I don't know if that's a normal thing to say or. Yeah. Wait, I, the, the, oh, so first of all, yes, there's a, there's a mention here of the offspring and the offspring of the, there's some sense of, of lineage of, of passing this on that seems implicit, even as I ask to be able to enjoy this, this experience, even as I recognize it as sort of my legacy as a member of the House of Israel, there's also some sense that I want, I want to be able to pass this on. I want to be able to transmit it through the generations. But wait, Leah, I didn't understand the, the what was the question oh. that you ended with? Oh, no, so I don't, I don't know if it's common. I don't, I haven't noticed this language before about not just offspring, but the offspring of Israel. Like it's not actually genetic. It's like everybody and like broadening it to everybody who's the house of Israel. Yeah, that yeah, that's like generation. Yeah, I just, I don't know, this is the way it's brought. It isn't like make it so that my children can be scholars of Torah, but actually the, the offspring of the whole house of Israel. So there's some collective experience. There's some like the idea is that we as a people receive the Torah and we as a people will pass it on. Okay, yeah, I like that, I like that. Okay, let's just look now at the last uh, blessing um, that one says over the Torah in the morning. Um, and this is also one that we say um, over the Torah when we, um, when we get called up to the Torah, okay? Um, Ash, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim v'natan lanu et torato. Um, God, who has chosen us from all the, the nations and given us God's Torah, right? Okay, I mean, I already had some House of Israel stuff here, but what, what's added in this blessing? Like, what, what, what is, this is a, a classic blessing that we say over, uh, over the, uh, the Torah when we get, get an aliyah. What's being added there that, Asher Bacharbanu, the one who chose us. It, it's just the same thing, isn't it? House of Israel, we're the house of Israel. We got it, God gave it to us. We're gonna pass it on. Like, why the extra blessing? What, 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 what's new here? Anyone? Feels like a different level of chosenness. Why? What do you mean? I don't know. Mikol Hamim. Okay, good. Know. Yeah, exactly right. It feels so icky to me. Not that you don't you like asked, it. but I'm just gonna tell you. Well, this and is. You don't like it? I hate it. So I'm. I'm actually one of the people who doesn't say it. I say im kol hamim. Oh, but why? Why is this so bothersome? From from. You have chosen us from all the other nations, um, and Hannah would, ch would change it to with all of the nations, right? Yeah. Why? I think that, well, that's so, that's so nice, thanks. Yeah, I'm um, changing it for you. In real time, the tradition is being changed to accommodate you, Hannah. I Jackson. feel so validated, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's, there's an ickiness to chosenness. I think chosenness is a slippery slope. I think that sometimes it, ends us in a pretty bad place where we elevate ourselves in ways that I find destructive. And I think that if we believe that God chose us in some way, I am, I believe that God probably chose other people in other ways and that, that we don't have, we have a singular relationship with God, but we don't have the singular relationship with God, especially if we believe that God is outside of our scope of understanding. And so I feel much more comfortable with the idea that God chose us and God chose other kinds of nations and people in different ways. And I don't need to feel superior in order to feel worthy. But what if you are superior? No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, that, no, okay, great. So what Hannah's pushing back against is the big concept, huge concept in Judaism that troubles um, many modern Jews, of the concept of chosenness that somehow we have been selected for a particular and maybe superior mission to everybody else. Now, and, and, and indeed, that is a troublesome concept for us uh, modern universalists. Um, 
but just notice how it happened, right? I mean, H Hannah picked up on this because um, I suggested, well, we already talked about the House of Israel. We're, uh, we were already in particularism land. And Hannah said, but wait, it's different when you say, we got the Torah and no one else did. We got it in, in a way that excluded them. And I just wanna show that that's, there's a kind of a movement that happens here in these blessings. Like we start out just speaking about how we're so happy to be studying the Torah, so great, okay? Then we start talking about how it is, it's great and it's a thing that we in particular get to do. We have this particular relationship to the Torah and isn't that great? And then by the third blessing, we're already saying, and no one else does, we're the only ones. So even in this sequence of three blessings, you can see that that theme of our particularism sort of slowly emerging, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really appear at the beginning. This, anyone could say this, right? Although I suppose you might say, well, the very notion that God sanctified us with God's commandments already Im Im implies that it's us and our relationship, but that theme becomes more and more prominent as you move through these blessings. Okay, keep that in mind as we head in. Uh, let's see, lots of hands up now. Uh, Kathy uh, and then Sophia. Uh, uh, well, I just keep looking back to the second one and I don't know if it's relevant here, but uh, knowing of your name and studying your Torah for its own sake. So it's especially that for its own sake, so that on the one hand, um, you know, it's supposed to be pleasant. It's this thing that's, you know, your offspring and your offspring and your offspring, but 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 it seems to be saying that you're really not supposed to be studying it for all those external reasons. You know, yeah. that it's not, uh, you don't study it because of all these things. And external maybe, reasons maybe, like what? External reasons like what? Um, well, passing it along to your children or, um, you know, because you're a chosen people and you, you know, you're, you know, that it's kind of instrumental in a way that you're, it's, it's, or, or even the pleasure, the enjoyment, you know, that's a, that's not studying Torah for its own sake. So I don't know what the, yeah, for its own sake, but I think that's kind of interesting. I love that. Yeah, I think that's, 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 a, that's, that's helpful. Not only do we see a theme of particularism emerging, but even as it emerges, it seems to be not just in tension with modern contemporary values, but also in tension with there are other themes in these blessings that seems to suggest that the Torah is inherently valuable, that learning Torah is an inherently, in and of itself, a wonderful experience, a pleasant experience, a sweet experience, perhaps an experience of knowing God or an experience of knowing, all of that seems like it just has to do with the very, the very experience of learning Torah itself. But then there's this context of, of so surrounding meaning. Well, this is our inheritance. This forms who we are as a people. We got it and no one else did. We're passing it on to our children. There's such a, there's like this social, cultural, historical context that, 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 all, that the Torah is operating in. And there's a little bit of a tension in these blessings between where is our focus on the whole big picture of our um, social, historical relationship to the Torah? Or is, it, or is it just about when you say, as, as Kathy um, highlights, that we're learning the Torah for its own sake, it's like, who cares whether I was chosen? Who cares whether my children will, will know this? Who cares about anything? It's just, I'm in the Torah, right? Okay, great. Uh, Sophia, you were um, next. Uh, I was actually gonna say, um, also focus on the for its own sake, but a slightly different inter or a slightly different answer would be that I think sometimes people talk about praying, the reason you pray is for God and not necessarily for you. And so in some sense, it feels like the way this is written also, it could be that you study the Torah just like for the Torah, which is for God. And so therefore it's, even if it happens to be pleasant, it's not, it's not for you at all. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. That's great, Sophia. I, there's, a, there's another tension there. And I actually think it's a parallel tension. A tension between, is this for me? Or is this for God, the Torah, right? And that too, I think you, I think you could track those two tensions, which is to say, you could, you could say, the more it's for me, the more I'm thinking about, well, how does this benefit my family? How does this make me exalted? How does this enrich me? How does this form my history? Through 
But if it's just for God and it's just for the Torah, then all of that stuff about my descendants, my legacy, uh, it's not about you. Just be in the, like focus on the, on the Torah, on God. It's, it, it doesn't, all of that context doesn't matter. So two ways of articulating a, a similar tension or, you know, or we can keep them separate, right? Uh, in, in which case, Kathy's tension is on the, the kind of the historical context um, uh, versus the kind of um, uh, in, individual experience. And Sophia's tension is the individual, um, the individual experience um, ver versus the, the kind of um, the, uh, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Kathy's was the kind of the essential experience of the Torah as opposed to the, um, the inherent experience of the Torah as opposed to the, all of the, the contextual experience. And Sophia's tension is, is it my enjoyment, my experience, or is it for Torah, for God? Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Nick. Um, hi, I actually wanted to just sort of touch on what, what Hannah had mentioned, um, because I think this, when we're talking about this particularism, it, it raises a number of really, of a, a number of like theological conundrums, because we can look at this, we can look at this sense of being chosen um, within, you know, within the light of like being a nation of a priest, right? Being a nation of Kohanim, like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean that we are, you know, a, a light unto nations, like we're held to a higher standard, yet we have a, a some sort of, sort of mission in the world to facilitate, you know, the goodness of humanity? Um, maybe, and I think that's, that there's an interesting sort of justification used in there, where people are like, well, why would you want to even convert to being a Jew like you can you can just be not Jewish and you can like follow the Noahide laws and you can be just fine why would you take on this extra thing to yourself for yourself and then um uh another problem that's sort of raised is that like I don't know I of course I think I, I like a lot of us find it hard to believe that like we are the only ones who have been given any sort of wisdom and we are the only ones who have some sort of mission in the world you know have something to do in the world um and then it makes me think about how it's, it almost seems sometimes, and this is something that I, I, you know, don't have a way to square yet. I don't know if you can speak to this more, uh, Rabbi Kasher, but, you know, there's, there's this moment where it's like Esau was given his own land, you know, and then there, he's going to be turned into his own nation. And to me, that seems to suggest that there's all kinds of deals going on. There's all kinds of, um, there's all kinds of theological interactions going on with different peoples and God. And, and maybe that, that in itself even points to like, like an even broader universalism, but then how do how do we square that? How is that? How do we take that from being just a henotheistic idea and actually like loop it into our modern modern sense of of universalism? You know, like I don't I don't know how to how to I don't know how to reconcile that. So I don't know if you want to talk about that. That's great. What was that word there? Henotheistic. Henotheistic. So it's this it's this idea that um and it's sort of used to talk about like well why is God constantly wanting um everyone to like say that God is the one God. Henotheism, henotheism is this idea that we acknowledge that we don't deny that there are many gods, but we only believe in one God, right? Uh, 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 that, that sort of that, that theological discussion is, 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 is framed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'm hearing in a lot of these comments, some kind of underlying question about whether the Torah and the study of the Torah is for some other purpose? Like, is it about who we are as a people? How we, what our status is in the world? How we relate to other people, what we do? Or is it just about like the experience itself, right? So, and if it's just about the experience itself, then, then we're just celebrating that experience. It could, it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, but that's like, that's not, that's not of our concern. Our concern right now is with the Torah itself, or is it Torah so that blank, Torah so that the Jewish peoples, Torah so that, right, okay, great. Um, uh, I wanna take the last uh, couple of comments that are up. Yonatan. Um, yeah, in the, in the vein of like, were we chosen and in, in what sense were we chosen? I, I think it was the the Maharal who talked about studying Torah as as a kli kibul that like you you form yourself into a a vessel that's capable of receiving Torah and um and, and maybe that's not just true on the individual level right like that we as Nick mentioned there there were other figures um who were not part of 
the Abrahamic lineage who had some interaction with God, but but there's there's a people group that was formed to receive Torah in a particular way. Okay, in, in which case you're saying maybe it's it's not about specialness exactly. It's about there the need for there to be some receiver. Torah has to come in the world. Somebody's got to take it. We took it, right? Doesn't necessarily exalt us or distinguish us in any particular way. They're just, someone had to catch the ball as it fell from the sky. Right, we're not special, the Torah is special. The Torah is special. And, and okay, great. And I think that is, that is one of the tensions that we're gonna be trying to figure out as we move through this. Is, the, is, is, is our thankfulness or our blessing or our celebration of the Torah sort of a celebration of us? Or is it a celebration of the Torah? Or is it a celebration of, I don't know, God, something else? Like, okay. Um, uh, I want to take Susan's comment and then, and then we're going to look at the Mishnah. Susan, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm not a scholar. I've always thought of this blessing as I'm just glad that I have capacity to be able to do this, to understand, to have the time, to have the book, to have the teacher, that I'm just being thankful for that moment of being able to learn. And so it's less complicated than what you all have been looking at. But anyway, I'm just saying where I've come on to this. Well, well, or, or is it, or is it less complicated? Meaning, I mean, I think that's part of the question we're asking. Like, I what, can see, what, I can hear, I can understand. I have all of this. Thank God I have all of this. So I can come on to the Torah and take it to the next place, wherever that could be. Good. So why not just say the first blessing here? I mean, I'm, I'm asking this question sort of on your behalf. Like, why not just say thanks for giving us the opportunity to be involved, the capacity to be involved? Why import all this other stuff about where it's going and what it means and how it makes me special? And uh, Okay. Um, I, I, I said that I was just taking Susan and then I saw other hands raised. Wendy? So I, I wanted to um, address what Hannah and Nick were talking about earlier. Hannah, I totally have felt, felt like that as well. It has troubled me quite a bit when I would see chosen people. And then I studied with uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Ober Omerman, who once told us he, when discussing this, he said, you know, if you go to Black Elk, who's the leader of the Lakota people, he will tell you that his people are the chosen people. And you go to other people, they are also chosen. And in, I think it speaks, yes, we are chosen. There, we are all created in, in God's image, all people on the earth. And each one of us is unique and each group is unique and we each have our path. And we are chosen in a sense, how we choose, how we choose to live our life, how we are chosen in the whole greater scheme of things. We are all chosen people. And, but when we, I think maybe it helps us when we look at ourselves as chosen, we, they, we then take on even a greater responsibility to be the best of who we are, whatever that is. And as Jewish people, we have, a, we have a sense within us, a calling. We don't go out and proselytize. This is something that is, must speak to us within, and as, just as it speaks to other people who want, want to be, or who are Hindu, that their, their teachings speak to them and they feel chosen to follow that path. So. Yes, we are chosen among other people for this particular thing. Torah speaks to us. This is our language. This is our connection, that, um, which is why we say all these things. That we, the, these are these, this is the sweetness of life for us. And, and that's how our, our DNA, our, our soul, our neshama, whatever, for whatever reason, this is our chosenness not to put down anyone else because everyone else is also chosen. But we're chosen better than everyone else. <laughs> um, um, okay, David, what are you thinking? Uh, do you hear me or not? I do. Uh, you, you do. You, 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 oh, now I don't. Okay. You don't mind. Now. No, it's not working so well. It's not working so well. How about now? It is working well. Uh, give it a shot. Okay, I think we're gonna have to move. 
or now. Now, now, now. You hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'll jump on the Hannah bag bandwagon too. Um, I've always reconciled that with um, we have to remember that at the time this is written, there. Uh, this is addresses what Nick was saying to many gods, and um, that's why God is always harping on you. Have no other gods before you, and He's always harping on I am your God. In in this, what we're addressing here, it says our God. Um, so. There's there's a reciprocal thing going on here. It's 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 our God, who has chosen us, but also we have chosen that we have chosen God. Okay, and that that to me has always been how I've kind of reconciled. We're chosen people because we choose to be chosen people. Okay, and, in other words, part of what this blessing is doing is saying, "Hey, you chose us for this, and we're into it. We respond. We affirm that. We uh, we we are grateful for having been chosen." We are grateful for been, having been given this Torah. Okay, great. I, I mean, we've been circling around this blessing now for, 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 for a while, and, it, and, it, and we're contending with this theme of distinction, chosenness, specialness, and wondering how essential is it to the formulation of this blessing, to the, to the very notion of what it means to study Torah that the tradition is handing us. So let's go all the way back Let's take a look at the very first blessings over the Torah, the very first notion that one might say some kind of prayer when one begins the study of the Torah. And, um, and it appears in the um, first tractate of the Mishnah, Masechet Brachot, um, in a Mishnah that um, sort of, it, it, it sort of, it's an add-on to a general discussion of when we say the prayers. That's what we've been talking about all along. When do we say the Shema? in the morning, in the night, when do we say the rest of the prayers? There's a morning prayer, an afternoon prayer, an evening prayer. We've listed all those out, and then all of a sudden, um, the Mishnah gives us another, another prayer that Rabbi Nechunia ben Hakana used to say in addition to his regular prayers. So Rabbi Nechunia ben Hakana used to pray as he entered the Beit HaMidrash, the study hall, the place where they studied Torah. And as he left it, he would offer a short prayer. They said to him, what is the place for this prayer? Now that's an odd question. And most, most translations say, what is the reason for this prayer? But literally in Hebrew, it's ma makom litfilazo. So we'll have to make sense of that language. What is the place for this prayer? And he replied though, as, as if the question was, why do you say the prayer? He replied, when I enter, I pray that no mishap should occur through me. The word here is, Takala, so some sort of some sort of broken thing, some sort of screw up, some sort of damage. I pray that no no mishap should occur through me, and when I leave, I express thanks for my portion. Hodaya al chelki. Okay, so let's just take this step by step. Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana would pray when he went into the Beit Midrash. Beit Midrash and then he would pray when he left. And I just want to point out, the language is slightly different. When he would go in, he would just pray, whereas when he left, he would, he would offer a short prayer. I'm not sure whether to make a big difference uh, of that. Um, what, then they say to him, what, what is the place for this prayer? Why, why do you say this prayer? What's, what's, what's going on in that question? Why are they, it seems like, oh, well, that's a nice thing to do. Why not, why not offer a prayer? Like, why are they, why are they suspicious of his prayer? Why do they challenge him? What is the reason? Why are you even saying this prayer? Yeah, Nick. Um, uh, this might be like a bit of a, like a polemical read, but it seems like it's actually, it could potentially be confrontational. If we're looking at this word makom, which is also used as a word, a name for God, you know, you could translate it as like, which God is this for? You know, which would be very, very uh, confrontational, right? And I think that it's interesting that the, the formulation is like hodaya, which like to, to give thanks, but it's in that form, which at the end of it also maybe, you know, um, very cleverly has a name of God in it as well, you know, like within it in like in a, in a poetic sense, you know? So I'm, I'm kind of seeing this as like a, a pushback of like, like I want to add the prayer that I want to add and others are like, well, no, what God is this for? You know, it seems like a, like a poetic pushback on, on that implication. 
Okay, that's a, that's a wild reading and I like it. I'm gonna push back on it myself a little bit. Um, the place you wanted to take it, like they're suspicious of even what God he's praying to. That's, that would be a radical reading. Like a, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna leave that there, but I do want to pick up on your general sense that there's some kind of suspicion here. Mm -hmm. There's something in their question that's like, what, what do you, why do you need to do that? What do you do? What is the thing that you're, why do you feel you, what is the place for this? Mm -hmm. What, like, well, I wonder what that would be. Why would they wonder whether he had, whether he ought to even offer a prayer? Um, Yonatan and then Leah. My, my reading of this is um, that he's undergoing some kind of growth process during study. Mm. Um, that when he comes in, he's very reactionary. He's worried whether something will go wrong. Um, and by the time he leaves, he has arrived at a place of thanksgiving and appreciation. Good. Good, okay. So are you saying that that's an answer to the question? Like what when they say, why do you pray? Is, is his answer, well, I'm acknowledging that for me, there's a kind of a journey, a, a growth experience that happens and I want to acknowledge, I wanna, I wanna say that when I come in to study, I'm worried, but when I leave, I'm grateful. And that, that, that is the answer. That's why I require a prayer to acknowledge that. Does that sound, yeah. Okay, Leah? Um. So when I was looking at it, I noticed that it mentions the word prayer in the first part and the second part is talking about a short prayer, like to pray and then a short prayer. Yeah. I'm assuming he's doing maybe a longer prayer in the beginning and you might think he's already done enough praying. So why is all of a sudden adding this little prayer at the end? Like what's going on with that? That's a great reading, Leah. That's a really great reading. That is, it could be, we have the word mit palel, like he prayed, and then there was a particular prayer, tfilak tsara, a short prayer afterwards. And it could be that they're saying, since they say this prayer, what is the reason for this prayer? I think this is a very strong reading. Leah's saying, they might just be asking, no, I understand why you said a prayer at the beginning. We just did that before our Torah study. Why did you also have to say a prayer at the end? And then his answer becomes something like, borrowing from Yonatan, well, there were there are different experiences. I, I actually feel very differently at the beginning and at the end of Torah study, and they're very different kinds of prayers. So it isn't just more of the same. I had to acknowledge a different moment. So I really like that reading, Leah. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, it, I was thinking about like, why, yeah, why they asked the question in the first place and sort of challenge him. And I, I guess the way it sort of sounds to me is that they're being kind of defensive, you know, that, um, you, you know, that he may be sort of acting like he's more pious or, you know, he's doing something they're not doing and, you know, but it sounds like, uh, so I don't know how much of that is going on. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think, you're, I think you're wrong. I think you're right, Kathy. I think some of that is happening. Remember, this Mishnah comes just on the heels. Let's see if I can show it to you. Um, in, so to speak, real time. Um, this Mishnah, let's see, is coming just on the heels of the morning, oh, here it is, the morning tefillah is until midday, right? The afternoon tefillah is until evening, the evening prayer, right? And so then he prays this and it's like, wait, what do you do? What's this extra prayer? We got the prayers. There's one in the mornings. What, what are you like coming up with some others that you're just praying all the time? You, you have your own little prayer that you do? Right? So that's one way to read this too. It's like, we, we, uh, there are three prayers a day. You say a fourth or in a fifth, right? So I think that that is part of it as well. Jamie? Um, it reminds me of when I was in Israel at Yeshiva and you know, all the, all the students would gather around the rabbis and they would, you know, they would follow them from place to place, constantly asking them questions, watching everything that they do, studying them and asking them, you know, little details about their behaviors. And I, I don't know if this is rabbis being cynical or skeptical of what his motivations are in adding on prayers, or if it's students who are sort of devotees and they're saying, we want to understand all the little subtleties of what you're adding on in your practice because you have a deeper understanding of 
how to connect to God and what prayer might be about. And so, you know, we're noticing this thing. Will you just share what those details are? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Sorry, I've been muted. Um, that, that seems to me like um, a diametrically opposed reading, but also very plausible reading. That is, it is also possible to read this as people who are, wow, Rabbi Nechunia ben had a had this extra prayer. I'd love to know more about it. That also seems to me like a plausible read. We can read it with a note of suspicion, or we can say, wow, this is exciting. This is someone prays over Torah, why? What do you do? What's the, what's the motivation there? Right. I think that's plausible as well. Uh, Sophia? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm sort of confused at the order of these prayers because it seems that they should be flipped to me um, because I guess the, the no mishap should occur through me. You would think that when you go out into the world after studying Torah, then you would say, I pray that I don't misinterpret this in the way that I act. And then you, like, when you enter, then you would express thanks that you get to study. So, yeah, I guess I'm just confused at the order. Love the question. I love that question. It takes us into really thinking about what, what exactly are these prayers and why are they in the order they're in? So let's think about that for a second. Um, when he goes in, he hopes that nothing bad happens, no damage happens through him. Something he does will cause damage. That's what he's worried about when he heads into the Torah study experience. When he leaves, he's like, oh, I'm so grateful. So Sophia suggests, uh, seems like it might be the opposite. I mean, so I don't know, what do you, what do you think either, either of the order or just the content? What does it mean that you would begin Torah study in some ways, gratitude is a little easier. Like, oh, we're always saying that's a, that's a classic mode of prayer. But what does it mean? I pray that through my Torah study, nothing bad happens, right? Well, why would you pray that? And why would you do that before you even start? What, what are you worried about? Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, you know, maybe on a simplistic level it still shows the power of prayer and uh you know i think as soon as you pulled that up i was sort of struck by that um uh, you know i think when i when, when i pray I don't, I don't think you know that i'm gonna change the world through my prayer or you know that i'm i'm you know bad things are gonna happen because i you know didn't have the right intention with my prayer or anything but i i I think there's something nice about it that it shows, uh, you know, how powerful your your prayer can be for both, you know, good and bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a real potency being suggested here, um, and I think in some ways that's that is sort of what that's our that's our big topic today. Like, what whether we believe we can like order the the spheres with our prayers or not. The idea is like, what kind of intention do we want to bring into our Torah study? If you said a prayer before you study Torah, what would you say? Would you say, thank you for letting me have something to do? Would you say, thank you for choosing me as a Jew to, or would you say, oh my gosh, I hope this doesn't go badly? Right? Like, what is, what exactly is the ten intention you want to bring? Okay. Other thoughts on, I don't want to cause damage or I'm so grateful for my portion. And, and, and I want to say, gratitude's an easy thing to say, but my portion, what, what's that? I'm so grateful for my chelki, my portion. Um, any thoughts? Nick, do you have a thought on that? You have a raised hand. Um, well, I actually kind of wanted to say something about what was just before, if that's okay. Um, uh, well, hold on. Any, any, yeah. uh, any, any other thoughts on what it means to, to pray for not doing damage? Okay, Nick, go for it. Um, I, looking at this moment and the way you framed it of like, oh, what are you doing? We have the morning prayers, we have the afternoon prayers, we have the night prayers, like why, why even have this, you know? Um, and this is an idea that I've, ex I've expressed to you, but sometimes when faced with like the immensity of like liturgy, even sometimes when you get to the end of the Amidah, it even feels long itself and it's like, and then at the end, uh, now you can add personal prayers. Sometimes I feel like, oh, now I finally get to, now I finally get to say something, you know, now I finally get to speak from my heart, you know? 
sometimes if the text itself isn't 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 bringing me there you know and i i maybe i'm being maybe i'm being cynical um but maybe i'm kind of maybe i'm seeing this moment of, of him saying like now i just want to say something now we're like obsessed with, with figuring out what the prayers are almost to a level of like scientific exactitude and now i just want to say something yeah 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 and then it, it, you know as you as you suggest that nick the idea that maybe this is just his personal prayer maybe this is an illustration of you know you can pray for anything and he had this prayer that he said then it becomes a, a more of a particular like it, it's about rabbi nehunia and his worry that he would screw things up like we don't say that blessing before we study torah why not so one answer could be, well, that's not our anxiety. That was his anxiety, right? But I, but I am wondering, like, what is that anxiety? What do you think you're going to screw up? Um, all right, Hannah, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at, at one last text before we close. I'm just thinking about what the power is of the transformation inherent in Torah in the way that he goes about it, that he leaves fundamentally different from when he arrived. And so he expresses that gratitude. And I think part of why it's outside of the fixed liturgy is that that experience of transformation is different for everyone. So mm -hmm. there can't be a fixed prayer for everyone's experience of being changed. Like what I learned from this Torah or this experience is going to be very different from everyone else's. And so if I'm supposed to express fixed liturgy for that, I don't, I don't know how that works. So I think it has to be individual. And I know that's also not the question that you're asking, but I think that it's related to his fear about doing something wrong is that he knows transformation is coming. And what will that transformation be? And what will he do with this new phase or this new way of being? I love, love, love that. That is such a, I love that, right? Hannah's like, not answering the question exactly, right? But, but in, in doing something better, which is panning back and just noticing that there are, right? And we've alluded to this before, others have alluded, but the, the, as Hannah's putting it, one way or another, you are meant to be, or you will be in a different state after you leave the experience of studying Torah. In Rabbi Nehunia's case, it's I, I start out anxious, nervous, and I leave grateful and happy. But, and you're suggesting, Anna, and maybe that experience is going to be different for everybody. So there, there can't be um, a particular kind of prayer before and after. But the bigger point that there has to be some prayer after because it's got to be different than what was before because the experience of studying Torah is supposed to change you, transform you. And maybe one of the ways that it can transform you is that you are relieved of all of the anxiety that you had walking into it. That is... That's, that's, quite, that's quite beautiful, I appreciate that. Okay, well, here's what we're gonna do just to take one final step. It's very, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I feel like in a way we could leave it at that. I think that, that's, a, that's as a beautiful a thing as, as is going to be said today. But it is, we're still sort of just wondering, like, what, is it, what exactly is he talking about? What does it mean to screw up or to have a, some kind of mishap, you know, take place for you? Like, it doesn't, it's not the first association I have with Torah study. So the Talmud is wondering the same thing. And the Talmud, which let's say is written 400 years later. Like, it's a messy process, and the Mishnah is codified in the year 220. And we have some sense that the Talmud is finally compiled in around the year 600. So it's like a process, and we don't know exactly. But let's say, this is centuries later. Um, so this is no longer Rabbi Nehunia ben Hakana himself, but it is others speaking in his name, and they speak out the prayer. In fact, they turn it into a longer prayer. And let's see how they answer the questions that we've been trying to answer. So um, the Talmud says the, uh, has a version of each of these prayers. So the sages taught, what does he say? What did he say when he, um, when he entered in? And it's interesting, they didn't say, what did he say, but what should he? It's almost like, they're admitting that they're kind of, this is, this is what, this is the version that we offer you. May it be your will, Lord my God, that no mishap transpires by me. That so far is Rabbi Nuhunia ben Akana. And that I not fail in any matter of halacha or law. And that my colleagues will rejoice in me. Yismechu bi chaverai. 
and that I will neither declare pure that which is impure, nor impure that which is pure, and that my colleagues will not fail in any matter of halakha, and that I will rejoice in them. Okay. So how, how would you articulate this anxiety? Right? He was worried that no mishap happened. What he, what he mentions here is matters of halakha, declaring the things that are wrong, and wanting, the, wanting his friends to be happy in, about him and wanting to be happy about, like what, what's the scene here? What is he, as, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the Talmud speaks it out, what is the, what's the mishap? What is he worried about? Let's see, I see Yonatan and Wendy. Yonatan's on the... He seems, um invested in Torah study, and the mishap is that the Torah study itself might go wrong. Good. So one problem is I might go in there, read something wrong, and just like misinterpret everything, screw everything up. Great. Wendy, what are you thinking? I think I, I, I wanted, I think it's somehow, it's connected to what Hannah said, I thought was beautiful. I think when you're talking about uh, studying Torah, that it's a journey. And it's a journey of education. And when we're, first of all, when we're talking about the people who you're studying with, what we say can influence those around us, how we interpret. And every time we approach Torah, how do, where do we go with it? What, where is the journey? Are we going down the right path mm. with it? Mm. And um, I think that notion of transformation every time one studies Torah, as Hannah mentioned, I, I think it absolutely is. And I think that maybe that is why we call it the living Torah, that it's a constant evolutionary process, even though th these words are from thousands of years ago. Yet, as we, we study, they're alive within us, how we interpret it, what we say, the people around us, that these things should, should be not a negative to those around us because it can go that way. One okay. can, that, one can I, be dogmatic I, I, and- uh, I wanna pick up especially on what Wendy's saying about the friends, right? It's very nice language. They, may they rejoice in me, may I rejoice in them. But the way that Wendy is connecting the ideas is to say, I am worried that I will misinterpret something and then that'll affect everybody around me. I mean, it's a little bit like, I think, the, I think the sages of the Talmud are, are with Sophia here in that what they're really thinking about, well, what, if, what would be the consequence? It's almost like it makes more sense as you leave or as a consequence of your learning, I might end up leading people astray or confusing people or like some, my study has the potential to affect other people and I have to be very, very conscious of that. Wendy is, is, is really, really aware of that. Okay. Uh, Take one last comment, and then we'll and then we'll look at the, our last piece, uh, Kathy. Uh, well, um, it's, it's somewhat similar, but I was actually thinking about it in a fairly nitty gritty way that uh, that uh, that there could be decisions made in the course of this Torah study, uh, you know, judgments made about what people can do or not do, and that it can have those direct consequences. So it's not just some sort of abstract sort of sense. But, you know, the, and, and maybe I've been, you know, I've been following along the Daf Yomi, uh, just summaries of it. I haven't been reading all the uh, text, but it's all these nitty gritty decisions that they're talking about, it, whether you can carry this or carry that, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, so it's not that they're just talking about abstract ideas. It really is. They are things that affect people's lives about what they can do or what they can't do. Yeah, that's great, Kathy. And I think in particular, the, the word here, halakha, which, which gets mentioned a couple of times, that idea that halakha, which is the law, but also like the way you go, the way you live out the Torah, that's emphasized here in the way that we did not see it emphasized in the Mishnah, right? And so the idea is like, there are practical implications. Torah doesn't just exist, right? We wondered about Torah that was just for its own sake just a beautiful learning experience that you had in the clouds where you were just, you know, nourished by God's word, the sweetness of all that. No, it's, it has to be, trans like, Torah has an application. And in that application, 
things get, get real and therefore get a, a dangerous. Like you can apply the Torah um, in a way that is destructive. You can apply it in a way that is, that is beneficial. So you have to, the rabbis of the Talmud are not just thinking about this sort of um, ethereal experience, but actually how it maps out in the world. And as, and as Wendy says, even in the Beit Midrash, even with the people around me. Okay, um, one last step here, because remember the, the sages of the Talmud are also gonna speak out for us the other prayer, which is just this very nice prayer about how I give thanks for my portion, right? Well, uh, it's very sweet as Rabbi Nechunia ben Akana said, but take a look at what the rabbis of the Talmud make of it. Upon his exit, what did he say? I give thanks for you before you, Lord my God, that you have placed my lot, chelki, my portion, among those who sit in the study hall, the Beit Midrash, and that you have not given my portion, me my portion, among those who sit on street corners. Right? I write, miyoshve karanot. I rise early and they rise early. I rise early to matters of Torah and they rise early to frivolous matters, dvarim batelim, worthless things. I toil and they toil. I toil and receive a reward and they do toil and do not receive a reward. I run and they run. I run to the life of the world to come and they run to the pit of destruction. Okay. So, I mean, I could, I, I could ask you, like, what's happened here? Like, how did it, so, like, suddenly just insulting all of the non-Jews, suddenly, like, looking out, or not even the non-Jews, but the people who don't study, anyone who does, anyone outside the Beit Midrash is, like, sitting on the street corner, doing nothing, making nothing, wasting their time. I'm, I'm so grateful for my portion because uh, my life is worthwhile, and, and other people who don't have this portion, their lives are not worthwhile. What? What happened here? Like, what, uh, what, what, like what, how, how do we get so insulting, Ulf? Anyone, anyone have a response to this that they want to record before we... Yeah, Nick? Is he going to start, start sh uh, shooting lasers out of his eyes at us? Because that's what it feels yeah. like. Yeah, well, that's a, good, that's a good reference, right? Because we, we, have come, we come across stories like this in other places. In the Talmud, you're talking about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the cave when he's in this process of studying Torah and then comes out and suddenly has disdain, not for the non-Jews, but for everyone else in the world who's not in this deep Torah study experience. Okay, yeah. Other thoughts, Leah? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, uh, oh you know, um, uh, Leah and then Alexandra, and then we'll close. Well, I was actually looking at it and comparing the first part of the first, the first prayer versus the last prayer. And the first prayer is all about like, re like rejoicing with, you know, my companions and we're learning together and, this is all really lovely. And the second one is now this negative connotation about other people and what I'm doing versus what they're doing. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, it's funny because on that, on that analysis, it's almost like the inverse of the way Rabbi Nechunia ben Akana was praying. He was very nervous and anxious in the beginning, and then he left very happy and, and positive. Whereas the way they have it is like, He's talking about rejoicing and being in this experience in the beginning. There are some anxieties, but he really, like there's something really celebratory about it. By the time he leaves, it's like, look at all these terrible, like there's something very negative about the vibe. Um, Alexandra, let me give you the last comment here. At first I thought of the, I give thanks for my portion is just a very beautiful statement of gratitude with faith that my portion is like complete, like that God will imbue me with what, what is mine. And that is to be, that is, uh, to be grateful for that. And so I, I, I also though, so I'm not comfortable with this more expanded version, but I also think it's worth looking at it through a lens of language then was not so PC, like we're in a different world today. Um, that's not how you talk about people on the street now. Um, so I'm also trying to look at it with a little bit of perspective in terms of differing political correct language. Great. That, that in some ways is where I want to leave us. I want to leave us thinking about what is happening in the Talmud that suddenly has the rabbis looking out at the wor world 
and, and, and having disdain for those street corner dwellers, right? Like what, what is the movement from the Mishnah in 200 to the, to the setting of the Talmud in 600? And I don't, I don't wanna presume to offer a theory, like I don't know exactly how this works, but the question that I'm asking is, why do certain periods of time seem to embrace a notion of particularism, distinction, maybe superiority, and other moments in either history or just sort of the development of a religious experience that seem much more about the experience itself. I'm not sure, like there's a part of me that's tempted to say, oh, well, it's chronological, like it's there, it, this is the way it goes, is first you're like, excited about the experience and then you start making it about your people and their status and you know it, it gets it, it starts to be um a claim rather than just an, but that already is giving like is offering a kind of a theory that i don't I, I can't really i don't know if i can stand by i'm not sure exactly how it works but i will just note that both in our opening blessings we saw the theory of particularism kind of begin to emerge Right? As we move through the blessings, we got more and more interested in choosing us. And so too, as we moved from the Mishnah to the Talmud, we started off in this sort of what seemed a very personal experience and then started to direct it to like its meaning for our people and the world and the other people and the worthless people and the lazy people. And the... so I think I just, uh, I want to kind of leave us with that speculation. Right? As we think about Torah study in particular, but just also as we think about our, our heritage in general, our religion in general, is what are the moments that, that are particularly, um, and, and, and are partic that seem to be particularly concerned with our status and our selection and our chosenness? Why, for example, are we in a moment, and Alexander was saying, what's, what's what, what is socially acceptable now? What's socially acceptable in another time? Why are we at a moment where uh, chosenness feels uncomfortable, right? That's sort of where we started. And why was Rabbi Nechunia ben Akana potentially um, also in a moment where chosenness was not as significant? And why 400 years later are the, are the, do the rabbis of the Talmud seem so concerned with that? So even as we, um, we don't say, you know, we don't get, call, get called up to the Torah and say, all oh, the other people are stupid. But even in that language of God chose us, you can hear that like, there are these competing themes about how we might view the Torah. Is it an experience unto itself to be just cherished for what it is? Or does it, can it be used to, to communicate some kind of significance and status about who we are? And why would we choose one or the other model? So just leave those questions open. All right, everyone, happy Monday uh, and, uh, and Shavuot Tov. Have a good week. See ya.